What does one think of when one hears the name Michael Lenke? Me personally, I think of Mike. My crazy, old, long-haired, fiery, passionate, spicy but sweet, shoot-from-the-hip friend and trumpet colleague. I've known and loved Mike for what simultaneously feels like forever and no time at all. It all started three years ago, in the summer of 2021, when Mike responded to my summons for brass players on the local forum page. I'd already heard his name uttered with great respect by many, but now was my chance to meet him. We played a wedding gig I'd put together and had a blast. For someone who was so venerated across the local scene, you wouldn't have guessed it of him. On the surface, he was humble and always grateful, and when put in a room with other trumpet players, he was a kid in a candy shop, comparing instruments and mouthpieces with anyone who could match his joyous energy. And the stories he could tell. Despite his humble exterior, Mike wasn't just a trumpet player. He was a consummate musician. I have met very few who treat every note on the page, and off of it, with reverence the way Mike did. He treated the music he played as nothing short of sacred, and his sound, his soul, took over every stage on which he performed. For many years, Mike sat in the Repiano cornet seat in Spokane's brass band. My first season in the band, I sat directly to his left as principal second cornet. The following season, I had to sadly abandon him for the front row to play solo cornet, which he himself never felt inclined to do. Then, for this past season, I returned to Mike's right-hand side in the soprano chair. He was only with us for part of that season before his health complications ultimately took over. There was also the time that during the 2022 Christmas concert, Mike was unable to perform with the band and thusly entrusted me with the Repiano seat and an improvised solo on a jazz number that came with it. A solo he had done many a time before and I am sure would have loved to give one last run. I regret to say I didn't do that solo justice when the time came. My chops failed me on stage as they had scarcely done before. But that is immaterial. This was not a position Mike would have given up lightly, nor to just anybody. So to have had the honor to play the part in his stead was not lost on me. We were slated to play a duet feature with the band for the May 2023 finale concert later that season. I still remember it well. At the March concert, Mike came up to me, full of glee, and announced that he would be doing the flower duet from Lock Me with the band, and he wanted me to be his second. Unfortunately, Mike went into surgery after our first run-through, and while he recovered well enough to play the concert, he insisted on not playing his duet line. We'll do one next time, we said. I vied later for my friend Tommy, a high school senior and new addition to the band that season, to be the first player. He'd spent the season stuck in the same seat as I had in my first, principal second. But even I had gotten to play some front row cornet in my debut season. I felt Tommy deserved something, at least. It was a pleasure to share the stage with Tommy, and we even got a good recording to commemorate the occasion, but what I wouldn't give to have another crack at it with Mike, and what I'd have done if I'd known we'd never have another chance. A man of principle, Mike had a profound sense of respect for his elders and inspirations. His first trumpet teacher, and founder of Spokane Brass Band, Mike Warner, made an appearance at one of Lanky's last concerts with the band. Despite his declining memory, Warner recognized Lanky and sang him great praises for his work. I wish I could show you firsthand the sight of Mike beaming with pride and childlike glee at his teacher's words. Just as his words and confidence meant the world to me, so too did the words of his instructor to him, even at his advanced age. And yet Mike believed in me, virtually still a kid in his eyes, infinitely more than I ever believed in myself. Wherever I sat in relation to him, right by his side or no longer within arm's reach, he always kept one ear out for me and constantly made it clear as day to me that he deeply admired my sound and phrasing and felt he was constantly learning from me. He was perhaps the first to provide such words of encouragement about my cornet playing in the band. Some of the most glowing compliments I've received about my playing to this day were uttered in the sweet, bassy tones of Mike Lenke's voice, oftentimes followed by the gruff insistence that he never sugar-coated or blew smoke. Coming from a player of such musical stature, those words meant the world to the budding cornet player I was, and still am. More than anything, I wish I could communicate that to Mike Lenke. The eyes through which I saw him, the love I felt for him, the veneration I felt towards his sound and stage presence, the, the delight I felt when we'd get distracted and joke around or talk about mouthpieces during rehearsals, that in spite of what an honor he felt it was to know me, the honor was in truth all mine. I can only hope that he is repaid tenfold for the love and good spirit he radiated into this world. It is currently the 15th of May, just got off work a little bit ago, and I'm on my way to visit my friend Mike Lanky for what I believe to be the last time. Um, he's currently being held at a hospice center in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I visit Coeur d'Alene pretty frequently, at least during the summers. Uh, I haven't been in a while, probably not since last year, and 
I never would have thought that this would be the reason for my first visit of the year. Uh, it's a rather somber one for sure. There's a video out there on YouTube of Mike playing as a soloist with Gonzaga University's wind ensemble, albeit from several years before I started attending as a student. And he played the very stirring tune, Gabriel's Oboe. You might happen to know it from Ryan Anthony if you were a trumpet player. Ryan Anthony was also a famous trumpet player, uh, passed from cancer a few years ago. And that was one of the, I think one of his most viewed pieces on YouTube was him playing Gabriel's Oboe. And so I figure if I am allowed to bring my horn inside, I'm gonna surprise Mike with my little rendition of that. Last night in brass band rehearsal, the conductor and I were talking about this subject and um, he was encouraging me to go see Mike sooner rather than later because things weren't looking good and emotionally it was hitting me pretty hard. Right now I'm doing fine but I know that's my body kind of shielding me, um, kind of feigning ignorance until the time comes. I already know this is going to be very tough on me. Uh, I, can, I can foresee myself bursting into tears either when I first see him or after I start playing. Um, it'll be a wonder if I don't, put it that way. But I guess we'll see you there. They say God's timing is always good, and I've noticed that to be the case many a time in my life thus far, but I don't think it's ever rang truer than in this case. I went to see Mike on that fateful Wednesday afternoon, and it sounds like Thursday he pretty much stopped seeing anybody besides his wife, um, and Friday morning was when he passed and was pronounced dead. I don't know how I would have forgiven myself had I not had one last chance to see him, and I'm so incredibly thankful that I did. It was very lucky that we had brass rehearsal um, the night prior and the conductor kind of prodded me a little bit and said, hey, if, you, if you've been meaning to visit Mike, do it sooner rather than later. I said, well, we got some time after work tomorrow. Um, had things not played out that way, again, I don't know how I would have lived with myself. It was really, it was an amazing experience to get to talk to Mike one last time. It was very surreal and emotionally raw, as I'm sure anybody could guess. But, you know, I got there around 4.30 and didn't really have a set stop time for the night. So I, I really just sat down with him and, and tried to cherish whatever time we had left, tried to just keep him talking about whatever came to mind. And it really was special. We passed maybe two and a half, three hours in this fashion and I told him that you know maybe I should think about hitting the road especially because he was anticipating some more visitors that he wanted to you know be mentally prepared for uh, but I did want to make sure that I played for him before I left and so 
I got my horn out and set the camera up, and it still was feeling a little surreal to me. I, I still hadn't really grappled with the whole thing. Um, from an objective performance perspective, I, I played all right. Not, not tremendously well. Not too poorly, thankfully. I mean, I really wanted this to be a, a uh, grand gesture of respect to Mike. Um, I wanted him to get to experience my love for him in this, this medium one last time. Um, I kind of fumbled a little bit through the first time through the melody and kind of finally slipped into the groove during the second time through. And I was surprised at how, you know, I managed to hold it together and not start bawling midway as I had frankly expected of myself. I finished playing and I, you know, I realized I was shaking pretty badly, but um, I was holding it together until I kind of came back down to earth um, and kind of came back to my senses, to the, to the world around me and not just the music. And um, Mike, his wife, Cheryl, um, and our mutual friend, Matt, were all just, just crying. Um, and that is when the floodgates opened for me and it finally kind of clicked with me what was going on. And that was, that was pretty intense. I mean, it, it hurts to even try to remember, but, um, at that point I was just, you know, I was just holding Mike's hand, him not wanting to let go, me not particularly wanting to let go either. Um, very tough for all of us, you know, exchanging our last words and, I mean, Mike kept just saying and reinforcing over again how how lucky he had felt to know me and how much he had learned from me and how much he, you know, admired my, you know, the way I played the cornet. There aren't any words I can think of to fully describe how much that meant to me. Again, like I said, the the timing could not have been more lucky for me. The fact that I saw him essentially on the last day that he was accepting any visitors and that it seemed like he was really happy to kind of close out in some sense with, uh, with folks like Matt and me. And um, I'm truly, it's, it's humbling and an honor to have been one of the last people to visit and, you know, one of the last people to really lift his spirits in in that moment. Mike was so very many things to me. I knew him for three out of my 22 years on the planet. But in that time, he was, you know, a, a fatherly figure, the cool uncle you could joke about absolutely anything with, the grandpa offering, you know, sage wisdom of all sorts, a brother or a, a goofy down the street friend who you could just mess around with and have a great time with and in school you'd you'd always get in trouble making faces at each other he was all that and more to me um in just three years i owe so much of the musician i am today to him we did the brass band thing together we did a little you know studio recording session where we were just kind of improvising riffs off of each other we did that wedding gig any time I played with him, it was a distinct pleasure. There were laughs, lessons learned, smiles all around. They don't make him like Mike very often. Um, he he was truly special. And this is a loss that the Spokane music scene is going to feel for the months and years and probably decades to come. It's going to be a very tough loss for the community. Um, but I hope that in some humble way, we can carry out the legacy that he has left in his wake and that hopefully he's looking down at us with a smile on his face.